Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Dr. Dustin Bird. I'm a professor of philosophy and religion at Olivet College. Um, and today I have with me Dr. Rudolf Siebert, who is a professor emeritus from Western Michigan University in the Department of Comparative Religion. And he also taught in the sociology department, who taught for over 50 years. Um, he is the founder and director of two international courses in Dubrovnik, Croatia, as well as another in Yalta, Ukraine. And he's written dozens of books and hundreds of articles on critical theory in the Frankfurt School, Hegel, uh, political theology, psychology of religion. Uh, and he's the foremost developer and founder of the critical theory of religion and society. He's recently published the book uh, Hegel and the Critical Theory of Religion, published by Ekparosis Press. Is currently working on a book on the authoritarian personality. Is a member of the Institute for Critical Social Research or, or Critical Social Theory, which was founded in 2021. Uh, and with that, I'd like to uh, welcome him to to uh, our discourse. Thank you, Dr. Siever, for being here. Good morning. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you as well. Very good. And I forgot to mention my longtime mentor. Of course. <laughs> Exactly. So today we're going to talk about the authoritarian personality, which is obviously something that needs to be talked about to be talked about with the rise of um, populism in in the West, uh, the the return of the strongman politics you see in many different countries around the world. So um, mostly, when scholars talk about the authoritarian personality, especially when they're coming from a critical theory background, they they return to the Frankfurt School's book. Uh, the authoritarian personality, uh, this very famous book that was, Adorno was a part of, for instance. Um, what is the what is the status of that book in today, Rudy? Is it still a, an authoritative book in the in the field of social psychology? Uh, well, of course, that was not the start of the discourse on the authoritarian personality. The starting point was rather that what Eric Fromm did. This book here, I don't know if you can see it, mm -hmm. that is the uh, uh, workers and uh, so uh, blue, uh, blue color workers, white color workers at the um, evening before the Third Reich, the Third Empire. So that was around 1930 that this was done with 8,000 workers were interviewed. And uh, so the question was the um, dichotomy or the uh, antithesis between the revolutionary personality and the authoritarian personality. So from the very beginning, it was this dichotomy. With the discussion about this dichotomy goes from then up to the day. Uh, so the, uh, then only later on, Adorno took it over and did the same thing with labor unions in the United States, but the results were so negative. That means there were so many authoritarian personalities in the labor unions that it could not be published. So it is still in Löwenthal's um, estate in the University in California and has never been published. But afterwards, another uh, work was done on a broader population on the authoritarian personality. And that is what you just mentioned. That came out then as a book, um, but still with the interviews which were done. And uh, that was all about the dichotomy of the authoritarian and the democratic personality. And the reason for Fromm's work was to find out how many people would be for Hitler? So it was three years before Hitler came into power that these interviews were done. And the result was that about 12% or so of the white color and blue color workers um, were on the right, that means were with the authoritarian personality, and about a similar percentage were on the left with the revolutionary personality. That revolutionary personality was later on called the democratic personality, and later on then the hoarding personality. So when Fromm came to Chicago, 
he could not use the word revolutionary personality because we are such a conservative country and he did not want to lose all his friends in Chicago. So then he changed it from the revolutionary to the democratic personality. But it is always the same dichotomy, the same antagonism between these two personality types. Yeah, yeah. So what are what are the defining characteristics of, of the authoritarian personality? Yeah, so um, the, uh, the whole study was done so in Frankfurt, in the Institute for Social Research. And there was another Institute of Psychology or Psychoanalysis. And Fromm was in this Institute for Psychoanalysis. And the two institutes joined there. That means uh, the psychological department went over to the uh, critical theory department, the department of uh, critical research. And so they cooperated, Horkheimer and Fromm cooperated. They were fr friends early on. And what they did, they, um, they were called the Cafe Marx at that time in Frankfurt. Jokingly, everybody talked about the of Cafe Marx. I grew up only 10 minutes away from walking from this institute in the working class section of Frankfurt. And at the same time, from uh, came also from Frankfurt, but from the bourgeois part. And Adorno came also from Frankfurt, and he came also from the bourgeois part. So the rich people lived on one side and on the, on the east side and the west side the Bockenheim, it was called. That was where the university was, where the institute was. And that is where I grew up without knowing, of course, anything of what was going on. So, and uh, what they did, they combined uh, Marx and Freud. They were not only Marxist. The um, uh, Horkheimer started with Kant. He was a Kantian first. Then they started later on Hegel. So they came only later on to Marx, and it was always a combination of great enlightenment people like Nietzsche and Marx and so on, and Freud. And so Café Marx was a little bit one-sided type of a name for the whole institute. And interesting enough, the, um, this combination of Marx and Freud was arranged by a businessman, a businessman with conscience, uh, Weil is his name, and um, his son was very interested for these intellectual things and worked in the Institute. And so the father had made a lot of money by bringing food from South America, Latin America to Europe during the embargoes, during the starvation in Europe and had become very rich. And he wanted to use this uh, wealth now in order to enlighten people about the capitalistic system and its problems. And so he uh, founded, he uh, financed this institute in Frankfurt, and he founded one in Moscow, a similar institute. And that was a very interesting situation because uh, the revolution had taken place. And there the communists now um, received that money. And of course, the businessman who gave the money had also the say. So he told them exactly what he wanted them to do. And so there was, for some time, there was a cooperation between the two uh, institutes in Frankfurt and in Moscow, and they did the same thing. So they combined um, sociology and psychology in terms of a social psychology and studied in these two different disciplines, the authoritarian personality and also the democratic personality. And they were, of course, on the side of the democratic personality. They wanted to promote <clears throat> the democratic personality. <clears throat> and of course, socialism was considered to be um, populated by democratic personalities, which was a little bit too optimistic because later on, obviously, the authoritarian personality arose uh, also in Russia and something like red fascism uh, developed out of this. So that is the context, the Weimar Republic, uh, the first time that Germany had a republic, the first time that Germany had a democratic republic and there were great people like Rosa Luxemburg and Dr. Liebknecht 
um, who uh, led the Spartacus movement, which all was very much full of uh, democratic personalities who were persecuted, prosecuted by the militias, and the militias were full of authoritarian personalities, and these authoritarian personalities finally killed Rosa Luxemburg in the canalization of Berlin, they drowned her, and they also murdered Liebknecht uh, and uh, repressed the whole Spartacus movement, remembering that great liberator of uh, the slaves in uh, at least attempt in a generation or so before Jesus, the Roman Empire and tried to overthrow the, the government in the, the, the patrician government in Rome, but was beaten and then 10,000 slaves were crucified on the Via Appia Antiqua, <clears throat> which is still there today, and I think we went there and uh, visited it once. So, uh, and there is always the issue if uh, Spartacus himself was crucified or if he fell in battle. And Catholic uh, historians always want him to have fallen in battle because otherwise he would come too close to Christ. So, so this is the historical background and uh, in which context this institute in Frankfurt and in Moscow too um, operated. So. They were all democratic personalities in that institute, and they were afraid of the coming and rise of the authoritarian personality and developed a scientific model or instrument in order to be able to predict the, uh, the coming of the authoritarian personality. And it was not so that the percentage of authoritarian personalities was very high, but it was rather those people who were in the middle between the two extremes and were passive and let the authoritarian personality return or do whatever it wanted to do, which made then Hitler receiving more votes. It was not a very overwhelming victory, which he had uh, in 1933, but it was enough in order to bring him into power and to make him chancellor and so on. So, they predicted it widely, and then they predicted again in 1962 when Adorno wrote a little uh, book, which today came out, which recently came out as aspects of the new right radicalism, the right wing radicalism, which was a prediction which Adorno made in 1962, which, by the way, for my family, was the reason why we came to this country because I had been educated in the critical theory in the prisoner of war camp in Camp Allen, and then was sent to Germany in order to transform the fascist state into a liberal one. And um, so uh, I did this from 1953, 46 on when I returned from the prison camp up to 1962. And then on the basis of Adorno's writing, we had the impression that maybe it could happen that the authoritarian personality would rise also in the United States and that it would be more important to fight it and to resist it here, because if the authoritarian personality could do so much damage in small Germany, what could it do in a country of 300 million people? And so Therefore, it was now more necessary to fight against the authoritarian personality in the States and to promote the democratic personality than it was in Europe. It was still a problem in Europe, but it was under control, it seemed at that time, and it seemed to be more necessary to look forward what would happen in the leading uh, nation. Uh, and so that is why my family moved here and from the time I came here in 1962, in all my teaching activities then, I was concerned with the critical theory and derived from it the critical theory of religion, but um, we were, no matter if it was in religion or if it was in the secular section, the authoritarian personality is in both dimensions. You can find the authoritarian personality in the secular realm, and also in the religious realm, and you can see that today Fox News would be in the secular realm, 
and the eternal word would be the Catholic uh, network would be in the religious realm. And sometimes they have the same person like Raymond Arroyo, who uh, is part is an anchor man in the uh, uh, eternal word and is at the same time uh, very active also in Fox News. So we have a personal combination of both of them, the religious and the secular. So back to this um, starting point then. Uh, so the real starting point is Fromm's work. And it was taken over by Horkheimer. And so the Institute worked in psychology, uh, psychoanalysis really, and in sociology and approached the a dichotomy of those two personalities in these two dimensions of sociology and psychology. That means really concretely Freud and Marx. Yeah, so what would be the defining characteristics? I mean, what, what, what defines an authoritarian, let's say, from someone who's simply conservative? Yeah. <clears throat> well, so you can find authoritarian personalities among conservative people who are very different from those who are further to the right than they are, um, namely the uh, fascist personalities and so on. So um, we never find anywhere uh, no, a combination. So the combination which I give you now is my own. So um, as I look through the studies, I think there are the following uh, characteristics or traits, personality traits, as far as the authoritarian personality is concerned. I think it is, first of all, romantic. Romantic in the sense that it looks backward to the past. So the good times were in the past, and these good times have to be restored again to make Germany great again, to make Europe great again, to make America great again. So the model of the greatness is in the past. That can be very different. So for Mussolini's fascism, it was the Roman Empire. For Hitler, it was the Germanic tribesmen. For Franco, it was the time of the conquistadores. And for Portuguese and so on. So for everybody, uh, the, this past is something else. But this is a characteristic uh, point, the, the um, turning backward toward the past. So. I had uh, relatives in Rochester who are building the streets in Rochester. And uh, these people, they remember the time when one could still walk freely in Rochester and there were no labor unions yet. And the world was still a healed place. And since then, things got worse and worse because now we have the labor unions and now we have left wing of the Democratic Party. And so everything goes down the train now. So that is one characteristic. And there is, a, of course, um, there is a dimension of art involved in it, romantic art, like Wagner, for instance, going back to the Valkyria and back to the Germanic tribesmen. And then he converted again and to return to Christianity, but then it was old medieval Christianity. So it was always this backward uh, type of orientation. <clears throat> Another uh, issue is the, the nationalism. <clears throat> we have today, we have Christian, Christian nationalism powerfully in this country. Christian nationalism, it can also be called Christofascism or it can also be called clerico-fascism. In Europe, the name clerico-fascism was usually used. I never heard Christo-fascism, but I heard it here recently. So, and, uh, so this nationalism, that means my country, right or wrong. Um, there is no moral equivalence. So when the other, when the Russians do some bad things, then we know that these are bad things, but when we do them, then they are suddenly good things. There are um, victims which we prefer, uh, like the victims, for instance, the Ukraine, and which we then uh, consider as martyrs, but then there are our own victims in Yemen and in Iraq and whatever, and they are rather neglected, and we are not talking about very much about 40 children in the bus in Yemen, which were 
just bombed out on their way to the mosque and so on. So um, this uh, um, is a nationalistic thing. My country cannot do anything bad and you cannot talk against the propaganda of your country, then you are a traitor, you are on the other side, and uh, it can become rather dangerous then under this nationalistic position. You could also say that nationalism <laughs> means that a nation has a consciousness of other nations, but at the same time, it may not have a, conscious, a self-consciousness at the same time. That means there is a mental problem, a split between the consciousness of the others, but one is not aware how one is part of that what one sees. One does not see oneself in the other, but at the same time, one may unconsciously project one's own stuff and put it on the enemy and so on. So that is psychologically and also sociologically quite, quite interesting. So. That would be a second characteristic and extreme type of nationalism. And there are, of course, normal forms of all of that. So there's nothing wrong with being romantic. And just if it becomes very extreme and penetrates all dimensions of life, then it becomes somewhat pathological. The same thing is, of course, one can love one's nation and one can love one's nation more than other nations because one comes from the Rhine River or one comes from the Mississippi and one loves those rivers better than the Molga or whatever. So um, there is a normal form. So the difference between health and sickness is not a qualitative one, but it's a quantitative one. That, uh, so if somebody weeps a little bit, that's normal. But if somebody weeps all day long, then it becomes pathological. If somebody laughs a little bit, that is okay. But if he laughs all day long, then of course it becomes uh, questionable. So that as far as nationalism is concerned, there's nothing wrong with lo loving one's country and have a preference for one's own country uh, where one is born and where one is rooted. But when it becomes quantitative, quantitatively, uh, the extreme, then it becomes uh, pathological. <laughs> Another um, element is capitalistic. The, is is pro-capitalistic, um, the type. Wherever this, you find that type, he will be pro-capitalistic. But it's interesting that it is not capitalism as it would be defined by, uh, by, um, the, uh, e by economics or by political uh, economics, um, like Malthus or, or Smith or, or Hegel or whatever would have defined it, namely as the private, appropri private appropriation of collective surplus value. That means that a small group of people appropriate the surplus which goes beyond the salary, which are costs of production, and that what the workers work to, which does not go into the hands of the workers, but which goes right away into the hand of the owners. And that the owners who own the means of production, that they um, um, are just appropriating that uh, without having worked for it. And that those who have worked for it don't get it and so on. That is the fundamental problem of capitalism. It is of course also in a different way, the fundamental problem of slavery the fundamental problem of feudalism as well. It is always a certain group of people who not working appropriate the work of the others and the others do not get what they worked for. And uh, it, is, uh, it is so normal that nobody usually thinks about it or whatever, but this is not what in, in which sense the authoritarian personality is capitalistic. It is rather, it is uh, 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 capitalistically minded in the sense that it thinks there must be leaders, there must be authorities, strong men, powerful men in the realm of uh, di the dimension of uh, the state, of history, and also of economics. So for Hitler, for instance, he himself, uh, Hitler thought of himself 
as one of those great men. It's a great man his, uh, his uh, theory of history. Uh, he had uh, Frederick the Great, for instance, the picture in his office in the bunker in Berlin. That is the example of the great individual. And there was a British author who glorified the great man theory. The great man is also present in Hegel's philosophy of history, but he is not really the one he, who uh, makes history. It's the masses as well, and it's providence makes history as well. And so for Marx, it is a class which makes history. So not individuals, and, and so, but never said what what um, fascinates the authoritarian personality is that great man in economics. And for instance, here for Hitler, that was Henry Ford here in Michigan. Uh, Henry Ford uh, um, disciplined the people in, Mich in Michigan. The, uh, for, without him, they would have gone fishing all the time and would have played cards or whatever. So he, the great man gives meaning to the masses. Henry Ford told the workers to put a suit on, to put a tie on, um, to sit for eight or 12 hours at the assembly line. If he turned on the speed and they didn't come along, he had thugs who would beat them up while they were working at the assembly line. So um, they had to be religious. They had to belong to some kind of a religion. They had to have two children and they had to earn enough so that they could buy their own product, the T-model. So that, that was the predecessor of the Volkswagen. Hitler gave the Volkswagen its form. He, he painted the, uh, 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 true, the form of the little Volkswagen. But the real idea of the Volkswagen and the highways, the Autobahn and so on, was a Fordian idea. So therefore Ford came to Berlin and Ford was decorated in Berlin for his great accomplishments. So for Hitler, Henry Ford was the great man in the economics. And uh, so was also somebody who would not tolerate labor unions. There was a big struggle in Flint and other places. So Ford didn't want to have any uh, labor unions. He used um, uh, African-Americans who came from the South as strike breakers in Detroit against the white guys. He was a racist, but he used the race, the black people against the white people in order to break their strikes. And there was a sit-in strike then in, in Flint where the federal army took the side of the workers and not of the thugs, which uh, the Ford company brought in in order to discipline the workers. So the New Deal as a contract between the American bourgeoisie and the American working class, which lasted up into Biden now. Biden is still a representative of the New Deal, including now also the, the environmental New Deal included, but it is still the idea of a contract, a peaceful contract between the classes who would um, try to show that the bourgeoisie would be willing to make concessions in order to satisfy the working class. And I think in the meantime, the, uh, the abyss um, between the classes and the incomes and so on has become so deep that the New Deal does not function adequately anymore. And that there are a lot of angry people who cannot be satisfied anymore by this contract, and, and we will see the result of this change in the election in a week from now, and then also two years from now. <clears throat> so that is an element of the present crisis in which we find ourselves. <clears throat> so nevertheless, the, um, that would be the, what we call, you know, the capitalistic component in the character structure of the authoritarian personality. And uh, it is uh, very important that if attempts are made like Bernie <clears throat> to bring social democracy into it, then this authoritarian personality will be very much against it, it will be for capitalism against uh, any kind of a Scandinavian model or German model of social democracy, which is a very mild form of uh, socialism, which does not do away with the ruling class, but which taxes the ruling class and uh, 
that means takes uh, a part of the surplus value and taxes it and then brings it back in forms of uh, uh, free uh, free schooling or free education or free health insurance or whatever is free it uh, cannot be free it must come from somewhere and it comes from the surplus value which the workers collectively produce but do not appropriate but which is appropriated by the ruling class and then the ruling class will be taxed on this and that is how the product of the workers returns to them in the form of uh, uh, free schooling or free education or whatever. That is how it happens in social democratic countries, as how it happened in Sweden and how it happened in Norway and Denmark, but also in, in Germany but um, and in France as well in Italy. Okay, so th these were then we have some psychological elements. Um, when the critical theorists speak about the authoritarian personality, they do it in, in Freudian categories. So in terms of the category of the ego and the id, and in the id, the uh, aggressive forces and the death drive, and the, uh, uh, also the libidinous forces, not only narrowly sexual uh, in a phallic sense, but in a broader sexual sense. <clears throat> and uh, then also the superego, uh, the ideals and the values which people have, and uh, then the reality factor in terms of the ego, uh, and then its orientation toward the outside reality of society. <clears throat> so in that sense, then the um, um, authoritarian personality has strong sadistic elements. Sadistic elements which are rooted in the aggressive uh, side of the character structure, which is directed particularly against weak, the weaker people. Sadistic. So when when Trump talks about an, a journalist who uh, was uh, handicapped or whatever and makes fun of him, that is a form of a mild form of this type of uh, of sadism, Doctor Sade. Uh, invented it. Uh, so the uh, uh, then of course also a strong ego, uh, the alpha element, the whole uh, authoritarian type of an ethics is a social Darwinistic one. Um, that means the uh, struggle for power. And in, in general, while Christianity had taught that that what man is naturally by nature, namely an animal, that uh, this is something which ought not to be Christianity taught, but the uh, authoritarian personality and the extreme, the fascist personality thinks that, and already the, the bourgeois revolution saw that this is something, uh, something good to be naturally is good. And natural, that means if you just feel happy, and you're happy, that is okay. So whatever somebody does, we say, well, but he is happy. And that is then an ethical justification. Of course, a bank robber is also happy when he robs a lot of things. And then, but we wouldn't say, okay, so, but he is happy or so. The murderer, the more he murders, the more he may like it and he may be happy, but we would not normally say, well, as long as he is happy, let him murder or whatever. So it is a nonsense type of position, but it is uh, massively spread all over the place that we just automatically say that so well, but he is happy. So therefore it is all right. <clears throat> so the, um, in, in, in general, of course, the disciplining of the id is always painful and people resist it, but to let it go is of course pleasurable. And so the authoritarian personality on one side disciplines it, but also lets it go, particularly in its fascist form, lets it go. And that is tremendously pleasurable. And so there will always be mass movements somehow which will follow it. <clears throat> so, so that is the sadistic opponent, but there's also another one which is more of a riddle. Namely, there are also masochistic elements uh, in the... Uh, authoritarian personality. That means the authoritarian personality is willing to suffer. 
uh, for the cause and rather go to extremes uh, to in terms of their suffering. Uh, I was in the Battle of Aschaffenburg and an American officer wrote a psychological book about the Battle of Aschaffenburg and what he wanted to study in order to understand the Middle Eastern situation better was to see why people who are in a completely hopeless situation still go on fighting fanatically. Because the American soldiers who had crossed the Rhine River thought they would be they were told there was no resistance anymore. And suddenly when they crossed the Rhine in the mine, they suddenly found the, the second Siegfried line and there's this fanatic uh, uh, resistance, which lasts three weeks I fought against uh, General Patton. And uh, so how, how is that possible? And so that is a characteristic of the authoritarian personality. He is willing to go to prison. He, uh, we have one of the Trump people now is four months in, in prison and um, he enjoys the whole thing. And he gains status in that whole thing. So. Uh, it is not that uh, that it uh, outlaws him or whatever, but people say, you know, he's a great man because he suffers that for his cause and it makes it very attractive. And if we would put Trump into prison, that would have the same, the same effect among those people who are authoritarian ones. And he has described it well when he said, you know, if I go to Manhattan and I kill some people, they will follow me anyway. That describes beautiful the authoritarian personality of the leader as well as the followers. And uh, by the number of possible or potential authoritarian personalities, you can predict who will win the next election. So, and then comes the issue of racism. Of course, that is a component, but and not all authoritarian personality, not even all fascists are equally um, authoritarian, uh, are equally racist. So Hitler was an extreme in that sense, and extreme in terms, of course, of the Jewish people. But he also was racist in terms of the Africans, considered them to be inferior, did not shake their hands when during the Olympics, uh, um, African people won the highest prize and so on. He was refused to shake their hands and so on. So, uh, so that was a very extreme form and led to the extreme to the one say conference and the decision to to use cyclone B in order to gas masses of people, but also including gypsies and homosexuals. And so it was not the Jewish people alone, but about six million of people were became victims of this form of, uh, of uh, sadism and this form of racism. Uh, and combination of both. Um, so that uh, the uh, Mussolini was less of a uh, less of a, of a racist and less of anti-Semitic. He imitated a lot of Hitler, but so did other leaders in in Yugoslavia or uh, in Croatia rather, and uh, also in Portugal and in Spain. But in Portugal and Spain, the racist element was much lower than in, in Germany, for instance. But then they all went along. They all rounded up uh, uh, um, Jewish people, in, including the Baltic states and, uh, and in Romania and in Hungary and so on. So it went all over the place. But the leading people who were driving the whole thing were people like Himmler or Hitler or um, the the uh, one say people, uh, by the way, many of them having a doctorate, some of them were stupid, like the leader of the SA, but others had high degrees. And among them was even the man who uh, uh, formed the Nuremberg laws, according to American models, by the way, um, but who would oppose the uh, gassing of the, uh, of the Jews. So. So this is the, the racist component. And I think that the racist element is that what motivated the critical theorist in the first place to study the authoritarian personality. That means there is always, when they study the authoritarian personality, they always study this anti-Semitism element. And so their experience in Frankfurt already when they grew up or at Stuttgart for, for Horkheimer, um, they felt this uh, anti-Semitism 
I, in my elite gymnasium in Frankfurt, we had some Jewish people who slowly disappeared without anybody saying anything or mentioning anything. And uh, so it could just be verbal, or, but it was, it, it could be felt. And um, so uh, already before the uh, synagogues were burning, I was there when the Frankfurt synagogue was burning. I came out of the swimming pool and there was the synagogue where from the from family went and the Adorno family went and who had great scholars and mystics and so on who were part of the synagogue. So, so there are different degrees of racism and uh, different authoritarian personality have this. It is possible that we have an authoritarian personality who has no racism whatsoever. Um, and and in, in the real sense, not in the phony sense where somebody says, you know, my best friends are Jews or my best friends are, um, are black people and uh, in, in, in a phony way. So uh, in order to uh, hide their real position. Okay, so these would be the fundamental characteristics of the authoritarian personality, particularly when we extend it then further to the right beyond the uh, conservative people. And we must really make a, a strong differentiation between what real conservatism is, like Eisenhower, let's see. Eisenhower was a real conservative. The real conservative knows that if you want to conserve, you do have to change. So it was Eisenhower who warned us of the military industrial complex, which now again makes this horrendous profit with the war in, uh, in the Ukraine. So uh, that um, is, it was really the military industrial congressional, he left out congressional and say finally in the last version, but he did warn us uh, seriously. So that is a real conservative. That is a man who did not want to talk to Werner von Braun, the SS colonel and the 200 SS men who will be brought along in order to get us to the moon. It was Kennedy who befriended Werner von Braun and then let him work. And uh, he would have gotten us to the, to the Mars in the meantime, if we had allowed him to, to do this. And there is a very tragic thing which we have in our politics that um, while there was um, an alliance, an anti-authoritarian, a pro-democratic in a certain sense, alliance between Russia and the United States. And Hitler hoped that it would break down. Uh, he hoped that the same thing would happen to him, what happened to Frederick the Great, that the Serena died and that therefore the alliance broke down. So when Roosevelt died, all the German newspapers said, the Serena is dead, the Serena is dead. That means they uh, hoped that this would break the alliance, but the alliance broke a few months after Hitler was dead. So um, too late for him. Uh, and uh, then, of course, we have this uh, issue then that the, uh, the denazification in Germany was stopped. The Nuremberg trials were stopped in order to get the German population on the side of uh, the United States in their struggle against communism, against Russian communism. And that reaches up into the present situation. So. And we have to reflect about that, what we want to do about this right wing uh, alliance now. <laughs> okay, so um, that is, you know, what I could say at the moment about these characteristics of the authoritarian personality. So one of the things that we often think about when we think about the authoritarian personality is that they're always for law and order, law and order, law and order, no rebellion against the law and order. So they're for statics for society to remain as it is, even though they have that backward looking orientation. But what we have found recently, especially with the latest explosion of populism, is that the right, the far right, the authoritarians are more than happy to, to enter into essentially in a state of exception when it comes to the law and to overcome the law, to try to overturn the law. We see that here very clearly in the January 6th attempt to stop the transfer of power. 
um, and to stop the Constitution. So the very document that they're constantly waving, the Constitution, little pocket Constitution, they're more than willing to to overthrow it, you know, to go against it, if it means the preservation of power for, in this case, their party, or at least for the people that or the party that they think represents their interests. Uh, what would you, what was the relation between law and, and the authoritarian personality? Does it need to be reflected upon and changed in some kind of way? Or is this, is this just the way it is? And we, our assumptions about the connection between law and authority wrong? Yeah, I think, I mean, there is, in, in this uh, law and order thing, there is, of course, some truth in it. So I grew up there, as I said, a few minutes away from the institutes for social research at the university. And every Saturday, um, people accumulated in front of my window in this Falkstraße, it was the name of the street, and they marched against each other. So from one side, there came the people with the swastika. And from the other side, there came the people with the red flag and the hammer and the sickle. And then be, and under my window, they beat each other. I mean, it was regularly a chaos there. And then the police on horses came and they beat on both of them. And then the wounded were laying there from both sides. And then the hospital cars came and picked them all up and so on. So there was a tremendous turmoil. and. Uh, it seemed somehow that the democratic constitution, which was new in Germany, did not work. It did not get things done. So in a certain sense, the, the right wingers had a definition of religion, not only to define uh, the enemy, which Karl Schmidt, but also uh, polit politics is the art to get something done. And there were all these parties and they were continually talking with each other and talking and they didn't get anything. They didn't get the streets clean and didn't get the, the uh, murderers from the streets and, and so on and so on. So in that sense, the authoritarian personality is anti-democratic because democracy seems not to be able to, uh, to control people and to, to establish you no know, peace in the streets and security of people. So people murder, get into the houses of people and don't respect property and, and so on. So that is a serious part and that can be taken uh, seriously, uh, you know, that they are for law and order. But then there are other things which are coming in, namely that they have a certain uh, lust for punishment. They enjoy punishment. They enjoy the criminalization of people and then to put them into, into prison and also the death penalty. They have a death penalty. Sometimes the worse the punishment is, the more they like it and so on. So we see that, unfortunately, we see that in the struggle about the, um, about the abortion. What sense does it make to criminalize the women who are already in so much in trouble and so on. And the fantastic thing is that those who are for, for um, against abortion, that they now they don't want the prison the people to go into prison. They, they first criminalize it. And then of course, when you criminalize somebody, he has to go to prison, but, but they don't want them to go to prison now. They know themselves that there is something uh, is strange in, in this type of a position. And it does not help, it does not diminish the abortion. It just represses them like it was before Roe and Wade. That, that means the, the rich people can go to Sweden and Norway and Ger Germany or whatever, wherever, or in the next state, wherever abortion allowed, but the poor, the masses, the majority of people cannot afford this. And so they take the clothes hangers and kill themselves together with the MPO and so on. It makes no sense whatsoever to think about the causes of uh, abortion and then to reduce the causes in order to get out. I would dare to make the statement that nobody wants to have abortion whatsoever. It is not right to say that people who are pro-choice pro that they are for abortion. I may be pro-choice and may hope that the women will make the right choice, but they do have the choice between the two things and about their bodies and so on. 
but there comes a sadistic uh, trait through uh, that the this enjoyment uh, in terms of punishment and worse and worse type of punishments and to believe that these punishments will do something the death penalty has never taken down the number of killings and so on or, or and intimidated people that they wouldn't kill or whatever wherever we have uh, the death penalty the, we have higher numbers of killings than in other states which doesn't have the death penalty like michigan or or uh, the uh, around chicago and so on <clears throat> okay so that as far as law there, there is a rightful demand that there should be law for an order but including also to uh, as long as you have borders um, of course the borders should be should be protected and, and so on so it is also here it is not qualitative it's quantitative um, to what extreme people want to let uh, others come in or not let the others come in and how many and, and whom and whatever so the uh, law and order there is some uh, some truth in that issue but it becomes distorted then uh, in terms of the authoritarian personality a democratic personality cannot be lawless a democratic personality cannot have a irrational type of uh, of freedom an irrational freedom concept the people who made the constitution knew that you could not have dem democracy without virtuous people that means people with a rational type of uh, of uh, freedom you you uh, we have the freedom of speech but we, we cannot shout in a theater full of people fire fire and so on and they all stampede themselves to death and so on there is a limitation to that we cannot put a bomb on the head of Mohammed in the middle of Paris with all its racial and, and religious tensions and so on so um, there must be with freedom there must be responsibility it must be a rational freedom Habermas has formulated that very well on the basis of Hegel's philosophy so and I, I think that what has gone wrong in our country is that many people have an irrational concept of freedom that they can do whatever they want to and then they find out that they can't and that is why we have more prisoners in our prisons than anybody else so um, that is something which we definitely have to learn fast that it must be a rational type of freedom which also means that with rights that there come obligations and that one thinks of the consequences when my freedom uh, de destroys the freedom of somebody else then there is something wrong with my freedom and so I have to learn to connect it with rational thinking at the same time it always appeared to me that you looking at uh looking at authoritarians no matter where they are they, they seem to be saturated with what can be called uh proteophobia which is the fear of the ambiguous that they they think in binaries things have to be this or that you know they're they're at home only when they're in their country and around their people whereas people with more democratic personality are at home wherever they go they can go around the world they're open they're curious in the in the authoritarian personalities not um you know lgbtq folks to them appear ambiguous they're, they're not male they're not female what are they that's very discomforting therefore they have to be rejected it's just male and female um race is the same type of way you know there's there's africans there's europeans there's asians there's nothing in between and the people that that racially intermix you know somehow cause this kind of this anxiety in them and therefore that has to be rejected it has to be suppressed and it has to be outlawed if they have power so it always appeared to me that this this type of authoritarianism can't deal with the complexities of living not only in the 21st century but just living in the modern world um, with all of its gray issues it has to be solidly black and white a or b one or two that's it nothing in between yeah i think a good way uh to uh, characterize the authoritarian personality is to connected with the adjective of inclusive or exclusive also empirically you know how you can when you talk with somebody 
or you can say to what extent somebody is an authoritarian personality. And uh, certainly there is an element of exclusiveness. That means uh, the, uh, the border issue, you know, to exclude these people who come from the South and um, or to, to prefer people who come from the Scandinavian countries or who are well-educated and others who are not so well. So all kinds of people are excluded. When we look at uh, uh, the President Trump there, whom he excludes, the Muslims and whatever. Um, so while the democratic personality is more of an inclusive one, so I think that is a fundamental characteristic of, of both of them. And then, of course, uh, is it, also this cannot be go to the extreme here. You cannot possibly include everybody. That wouldn't, would lead to chaos, probably. And they cannot, the authoritarian personality cannot exclude everybody. So um, the... Trump, uh, on one side, he may be anti-Semitic in some ways, but he has included the Jewish son-in-law. And uh, so <clears throat> there are, they, even as far as the Nazis were concerned, they all have their friendly Jew. Hitler had his doctor who treated him and treated his mother and so on, and he treated him well, protected him and so on. So the SS guys had Jewish girlfriends very often and so on. Jewish concubines, and so <clears throat> there is, in the excluding authoritarian personality, there is also a minimum of inclusiveness, otherwise it couldn't even exist. <clears throat> and also with the democratic personality, there must be a certain minimum of, um, uh, of uh, <clears throat> there must be a limit to the inclusiveness, <clears throat> otherwise he would uh, threaten his own existence. And then, of course, you know, to differentiate in this complexity, you are absolutely right. <clears throat> it is um, it is very hard to uh, to differentiate different things which come to us. Uh, they see the issue of war and peace, and so on. It's very <clears throat> it's very um, complicated, and uh, overstresses the rationality which most people have, <clears throat> and then they feel very confused and they feel very frightened too because they they have the feeling of control the authoritarian personality wants to control and then things are so complex that they cannot be easily controlled and then they become frightened and out of the fear <clears throat> they do strange things so when you look at authoritarian catholicism for instance how how did they ally themselves with all these fascist states? The, uh, the uh, concorded with um, between the Vatican and Mussolini, and uh, the Empire concorded with Hitler, and the concordates with Salazar and with Franco and so on. How did Catholicism become fascist? Because out of fear, out of fear of the Soviet Union, out of fear of communism, that communism could take over. And no real idea what that is. Nobody read Marx or whatever. It's still today in the eternal word, like in Fox News. No idea who Marx was or what he has taught or how he was different from Adam Smith or whatever. No real knowledge whatsoever. Just this vague thing that there is some kind of a big boogeyman who threatens everything. And uh, it is this fear then which drives people to extreme positions which they don't uh, want to take really but they find themselves i had a pastor who said in the last month of the uh, war who had been persecuted by by the gestapo and so on but he still thought that hitler was the only man who could protect europe from the uh, from the slavic world from the bolshevists and the communists and so on so and he was not a stupid man he was rather intelligent, but he um, still was driven by his fear into extreme positions. Yeah, so when we think about the authoritarian personality, obviously, I, I think the, the findings of 
what was published in 1950 of the authoritarian personality, the percentage wise of authoritarians or revolutionary personalities probably still holds true today to a certain extent. Um, I, I wonder what what institutions in society create the authoritarian personality? Because I haven't, uh, you know, there's some arguments that, you know, some level of it is genetic, but it seems to me more like the context, the social context, which creates uh, authoritarians. And, and that could be in the family, that could be in civil society, that could be in the state, that can be in religious institutions. Um, where do the Where does the authoritarian come from? Well, I mean, the Frankfurt School, you know, starting with Freud, they would certainly say that it has something, or it may have a biological type of a basis or psychoanalytical type of a basis in terms of the structure of the id or the structure of the ego or also of the superego. Um, but uh, the uh, a book which Horkheimer wrote together with uh, Marcuse and uh, Fromm uh, it was published in France then, that was about the family. So they talked about the authoritarian family and they have talked about the authoritarian state and they talked about the authoritarian religion. So it's in all three of them. And um, it was certainly, the family was very important, the family education. How many guns are there? Which role do, do guns play? When, when we educate children and uh, what military movies, war movies, and, and so on, all that may, uh, you know, contribute to the formation of the authoritarian personality. The example of the father, and the father behaves like a sergeant in the army or so. It may uh, all kind of little authoritarian personalities in the, in the family growing up that way. Stories, of course, with the authoritarian personality, there are certain stories involved. The stories which uh, people tell when they come home from the First World War or the Second World War. They tell story, they make myth, they tell how, how courageous they were, how many enemies they killed, and, and so on. So um, the stories the, which then turn into myth or into ideologies, ideology understood as false consciousness and um, as hiding of economic or other political motivations or simply the untruth. Uh, I, I experienced that massively that I had uncles or so who had participated in the war and told all these fantastic war stories or John Wayne in our movies, in the cowboy movies, the sheriff, and, and so on. Uh, John Wayne was certainly an authoritarian personality and reached in innumerable families and uh, sh helped to shape the character of people. <coughs> so uh, the family and uh, then also the religion, the Adorno made all these studies of fascist ministers here in, the, in this country. Uh, where he analyzed the sermons and so on in every detail. And they are repeated now again, like it was in the 30s. Uh, so um, the, the, uh, that is also uh, where, this is also a place where authoritarian personalities are formed. And I had you know, many people who were raised in the Catholic youth movement and then fit very well also into the um, Hitler youth or fit very well into the army and were excellent army officers and so on and were proud of it and so on. So I, I think probably the best officers in, in, in the German army, not in the SS, but in the German army came out of the Catholic youth movement led by the Jesuits. So, um, uh, so that uh, if we ask, you know, what are the environments in which this character is formed, uh, then, and, and not a matter of uh, uh, biological heritage, but uh, in terms of education, then I think the family and the, uh, <clears throat> and, and the, uh, the, the church played a great role, and then also the corporation. We don't, we never had economic democracy here in this country, and so on. So, our corporations are all organized in terms of the uh, authoritarian principle and authoritarian personalities. Uh, Ford certainly was an authoritarian personality. He drove his son 
into a suicide uh, who uh, was more of a democratic uh, shape and form and so on. So uh, the, uh, that's where people, whatever they have learned in the church, whatever they have learned in the family is then reinforced wherever they work in the, uh, the corporation, which has an authoritarian structure. Yeah, it's very interesting that um, Trump's older brother, Fred Trump Jr., also was driven into suicide by this massively yeah. authoritarian father, right. uh, which, you know, it, it, it suited Donald well, you know, to, to please his father by being this authoritarian, little authoritarian and bullying people and whatnot. But his older brother, who was more of a democratic personality, who didn't want to go into business, didn't want to go into the corporation, but wanted to become an airline pilot because he liked to travel and see the world. That was this cardinal sin for his father, the authoritarian. And he called him something like a glorified um, a cab driver or something like this yeah. and the man unfortunately drank himself to death but um it, yeah it seems to me that that you know the family plays that initial role of creating the authoritarian personality among little ones by emulating their parents especially the father if they're more traditional family and then they get into the civil society that's antagonistic where that authoritarian killer instinct, you know, serves them well. And if it doesn't, you're going to be a loser. You're going to study art. You're going to study social work. That's a loser, you know. And so the pressure there is to succeed. In order to succeed in a capitalist society, you have to be that killer, you know. And then if that, that's reinforced by the religious institutions, right, that this is somehow the way that, that God made the world, that this is somehow, you know, what you have to do if you're going to be a champion for Christ or something like this, or a, a Muslim who stands up for the Islamic world, that also feeds into that that authoritarian um, personality. And then if the state shows up to be authoritarian, right, the crime and punishment type of uh, state, the uh, the state that allows someone like a Donald Trump uh, or a Bolsonaro or any of these other strong men to come in and impose the will in the name of the order, you know, law and order on people who are generally more marginalized. Right? I, what kind of effect that has on younger kids? I mean, I see it from my own students that if, you know, students from maybe seven, eight years ago were much more open to ambiguity, open to the grayness of life, open to others, and now I'm starting to see the ones that that came into their early adulthood under Trump being really crass, you know, ready to make fun of people who are marginalized, you know, ready to bully people. And it comes out in their papers. It comes out in their writing. You know, who do they idolize? They idolize these authoritarian personalities. And so it, it seems like there's all these large institutions within our society that create these people. And this is probably why it's so important for people of the democratic personality not to withdraw from the state, not to withdraw from civil society into private right, for instance, but to be in, in public, be in the public life, be in the public world and, and do whatever they can to counter this, because this is powerful. I mean, let's be honest, we live in a very antagonistic civil society. Right now, we're living in a time where confusion is rampant because of, you know, the proliferation of social media, the proliferation of fake news, alternative facts, things like this, where people are so confused. And there comes this one clear voice that says, no, A is A, B is B, right? And it gets rid of that confusion. They find a home there. And before long, they're part of this authoritarian movement and or a cult, right which is very similar to the political what i mean by that is the the political cult of of someone like a donald trump where he could even leave the stage and someone else can take his place but the cult will remain certainly yeah. and, and it's very hard to resist do i and i think you know how i grew up in in germany i had an uncle who was a judge as a judge he was the absolute master of the whole district over which he presided, and he took us out, and and we walked through the through the mountains there, and so the boys couldn't drink water; they had to be strengthened and they had to be hard and disciplined and march without doing it. The girls could drink something because they were just girls, and 
they didn't fit into the whole thing anyway, but the boys had to do this. And, and that made you proud. That means there was a recognition involved. You were recognized and we need recognition as we need food. And so uh, little guys who should resist that, it's, it's very difficult. And then in the corporation, it's the same way. It needs a tremendous amount of guts to stand up in a fascist state or stand up in an authoritarian uh, author corporation and so on for this democratic ideal, which somehow appears to be weak. We have this situation now in the Ukraine where yesterday I read an article where somebody said we should do what the Russian government did in the Cuban crisis and should now withdraw and so on. Well, that doesn't sound like manlike or to withdraw or to give in or whatever. It cannot be done. That doesn't fit this authoritarian type of a style. So, uh, and there is a problem. There is a real problem. How can one democratic and one can, can be democratic and one can still govern? The um, Hitler saw very clearly that the authoritarian character of the Roman Catholic Church was its strength. He had a great respect when he saw a cardinal with a uniform marching around. It reminded him of the Roman Empire. And the Protestant ministers there with their bourgeois pants on and so on, that was something he just ridiculed. So, um, the, this uh, how can a democratically democratic person succeed? How can he? I mean, a certain amount of order has to be established. So, how can he do that? Will not people all run run over him because he is so nice and he is so good and and, and so on? So. So it is um, important to look at both personality types. And if we are in sympathy of the democratic one to see how we make the democratic personality viable and functioning well in the family and in the state and, and so on. Uh, you see the, the um, personality, the authoritarian personality, the Roman Catholic Church was successful in keeping people together for the last 500 years and the democratic more democratic protestant churches split into thousands of different groups um, there is this horrible example of the inquisition the holy inquisition which invented the waterboarding and inherited it to the to the ss and then to the cia and, and so on so people want to see results and they want to have more than talk and so but the democratic personality wants to have discourse how do you make people more patient that they are ready for discourse and not just fast action so we are in a very difficult situation so we could think of uh, you know the fundamental traits of the democratic personality and uh, what one can do about those traits. Yeah, I mean, you see that a lot in, in literature of the far right and alt right, the, the fear of gynocracy, the fear of women controlling and ruling, you know, because that's not strong, that's not strength when men are controlled by women. Uh, you know, you have to have that traditional male model to, to, and that's the only way strength is projected on the world stage is through a male and not through a woman and I, you know of course we look at some of the most powerful and well-respected uh leaders in the world and many of them at least in the late 20th century into the 21st have been women doesn't mean they're perfect um you know in some cases like margaret thatcher for instance she had something to prove that she was tougher than the men that that was a certain pathology that she had but, you know, is it, can we not consider it strength when women are at the forefront of equal rights, when women are at the forefront of bringing health care to, to their people? You know, to me, that's, that looks like strength, but that might be a democratic personality trait as opposed to someone that says, no, what is strength is, you know, the, the, the rule of the jungle. The powerful will find a way to have health care. The powerless, let them die in the streets, right? 
that's that old traditional arist arist um, the arist ar excuse me aristocratic law of nature right at play and that's what strength so you know i think you're right i think we're going through a at least in the west a certain level of psychosis when it comes to yeah that's right you know, but i think you know that the authoritarian and the this this um antithesis that this is present in both genders you know that it is present in the religious and the secular realm that it is present in different races so uh, I think we can find the same dichotomy in all kinds of different dimensions. And so that one is a woman does not mean you cannot be an authoritarian personality. And also about uh, socialists, you know, I think at the beginning form may have thought that um, the authoritarian personality belonged, you know, to capitalism and, and that uh, all socialists were democratic personalities. And, then came the development in the Soviet Union, where obviously, you know, because of the attacks from outside, 12 capitalist countries marched into Russia, you know, up to Murmansk, and, um, and then the industrialization, which hadn't been done and which they had to do, they became more and more authoritarian and more, less and less democratic and less and less socialistic and finally ended up in red fascism long before the neoliberal counter-revolution became victorious. So um, I, I think we have to, one could almost speak about the universality of both of these types. They can appear, you know, different genders, races, nations, and so on. There was sure. a question, you know, is national socialism only possible in Germany, you know? No, I mean, everybody can get it. You can get it in the African state somewhere. Yeah, it's not easy. To, it's not hard to find authoritarian personalities on the left in today's use of social media. It's really easy to find. I mean, there's reasons why comedians don't go on university campuses anymore. You know, because again, it's that ambiguity of, of, you know, making fun of this group or that guru, but not in a mean sense, in a mocking sense, but in a way of not taking ourselves so seriously. But you can't do that on certain campuses anymore because there's an authoritarian side on the, not so much on the political left, but on the cultural left that said, you know, absolutely not, no more that you cannot say that you can't do this, you can't do that. And these are other people who are relatively, say, culturally liberal or on the political left, but they're not allowed to say certain things anymore, um, not by generally not by policy, but by culture, you know, that the culture has shifted. Um, and so it's not hard to find, I think, personality, uh, authoritarian personality folks on the left. Um, I don't think they're as prominent as they are on the right, um, but um yeah, it's certainly something that can affect both both sides of the spectrum, but not in equal measure. I don't want to equivocate here. I don't think it's e you know an equal measure. Yeah. Certainly on both sides at some point. Well, Dr. Sieber, I think we're about at our time. It was uh, wonderful to have you uh, on this talk and to discuss the authoritarian personality. And we really look forward to uh, your new book that you're working on. Mm -hmm. Difficult mm -hmm. one? What's that? A very difficult one. A difficult one, yes, of course. So if, from what I understand, it's authoritarian personality in different parts of history and people and things like that. Is that what it is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Look forward Thank to seeing Thank you for your great questions. Thank you very much for entertaining my great questions. <laughs> All right. Have a good day. Yeah, same to you. Thank you. Thank you.